Hi, I'm Steve Albini and I am at La Fabrique for the Mix with the Masters seminar. And I'm going to answer some questions that have been submitted by readers of Sound on Sound magazine. The first question is from Mark Gallagher. And he says, have you got any tips on separating two similar sounding electric guitars in a mix? Um, it sort of depends what the context of the two similar sounding guitars is and what the rationale for having the two guitars is. Um, it, I don't often double a part or a, uh, um, a guitar part using the same guitar um, so, if the problem is that you have two takes of a, a, or two performances of a guitar part played on the same guitar, um, it's going to be very difficult to um, separate those two. The guitar parts will just sound very similar and the, the guitars themselves, bec because it's the same guitar, um, the overtones and harmonics of the part will tend to be duplicated in both and, and they'll superimpose on each other and it, will, it can often be quite muddy. So in that situation, it, I, I would have proposed using a different guitar for the second of the two or for, for the second of the two parts that were um, making up the doubled part. That is, if you have a guitar playing the main part and you want to double that part, um, I would, would suggest doubling it with a different instrument. If it's not possible to double it with a different instrument, if you only have one guitar, then it may be possible to uh, play the, uh, the same or a similar part from a musical standpoint, but using different chord shapes or using different inversions of the chords or using different positions on the neck. Um, utilizing the different strings for different notes so that the 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 while the part may be musically identical may be musically the same you're using different positions on the on the guitar to to create the same notes in the chords and that will avoid some of that duplicated quality that overlapping quality of the of the um, harmonics and the overtones if that's not possible, it may be possible to retune the guitar for the second take. Um, you can, for example, detune it by a semitone and then put a capo on the first fret. And again, you're using uh, different parts of the guitar, different strings, different hand positions, uh, different fundamental pitches of the native strings to play the same part, but in a manner that will will cause the sound quality and the, uh, the harmonics and the overtones of the two parts to be different. Um, that makes it much easier to discern them as separate sounds. So I guess what I'm saying is that if you have that problem, if you have two guitars playing the same part and they're doubling and you're, you want to separate them, the, the, the way to solve that is in the recording process and not in the mixing process. Uh, at the mixing stage, if you're if you're just contending with two guitars that are two parts that were recorded on the same guitar and they overlap and they sound indistinct, then you can try separating them in stereo, for example, so that you have one in one speaker, one in the other speaker. Um, that won't solve the tonal problem of having them be too similar tonally, but it should give you the localization should make it easier as a listener to discern the difference between the two parts. So that's one case of having two guitar, two guitars that you're trying to make a, distinguishment, make a distinction between. If you're talking about two performances uh, using two different guitars, possibly played by two different people, and they just happen to have a similar tone, um, then I I would solve that problem typically using the stereo image. I would spread them in stereo or have one be center channel and one be off to the side or something like that. So that um, whatever slight differences there were in the, in the, in the performance or arrangement, um, you would be able to hear that, spot those differences because the localization cue 
would give you information that you were listening to two sounds rather than one sound. Um, and in, in that case, if it's one person performing both parts, um, it's even if the parts are different, I still think that there's benefit to using a different instrument. Um, and when I say instrument rather than amplifier because uh, the difference <coughs> between amplifiers or between different pedals, for example, is not going to have as much of an effect on that superimposition quality that I was describing as changing the instrument will. That is, if you take uh, the same guitar and play it through two different amplifiers and superimpose those signals, um, harmonically they will have an awful lot more in common than if you have two different instruments and you play one through one amp and one through another amp. Uh, and that, the, you know, that difference is more significant uh, than the difference that can be introduced by using a different pedal or a different amplifier or a different miking technique or something like that. Just the fact that you're using a completely different instrument uh, makes a much bigger difference uh, in, the, in the sounds and in terms of uh, what you can perceive as different. Um, you can hear, have completely different distortion character, uh, and, but the underlying instrument sound will, be, uh, will still be revealed. So if you have two of the same instrument, uh, it's going to be more confusing than if you have two different instruments. And I'm, when I say two different instruments, I don't mean like one should be a baritone and one should be a guitar. I mean, just I even if you have two identical or seemingly identical guitars, like if you have two Les Pauls, uh, if you play those two Les Pauls as two separate performances, um, the subtle differences in intonation, uh, in string tension and positioning of the pickups and all these, all the very small differences that there are between any two items that are uh, m that are physically different the the subtle differences will manifest themselves and it'll make it easier to hear the difference between the two instruments Yanis Petrianis asks could you recreate your signature drum sound if you had to work in a basic project studio and how what if you had to work with samples well uh, I've, other than in the case where I was recording a band that used a drum machine or that used uh, a sequencer and samples as an organic part of their band sound, um, I've never had to work with samples replacing parts of the drum kit. Um, I have very, very rarely been in a scenario where the band augmented the r live sound of a drum with uh, triggered samples or triggered uh, special effects. That's ex extraordinarily rare. I can only think of a couple examples where that's happened. Um, but uh, as regards my signature drum sound, uh, I think what he's referring to is um, a natural room reverb uh, on the drums, like a room sound that's uh, pretty evident. and that sound appears on a lot of records that I work on because it suits the aesthetic of a lot of bands that I work with. Uh, over a, a fairly long period of the evolution of recorded music, the people who worked in studios recording music were a different class of people from the people who worked, who were in bands and performed music and there developed an aesthetic where the recorded sound of music, in particular the recorded sound of a drum kit, um, was not representative of the organic live sound of a drum kit in a rehearsal room or on stage or in a club or anything like that. Um, and that culminated in a period in uh, you know, the late 70s, early 1980s, when um, producers and engineers were, were willfully replacing drummers in bands with drum machines because they were more predictable and they more closely approximated the idealized sound that these producers and engineers had been striving for in this um, disassociated studio aesthetic. Um, starting with the, the punk era and carrying on to now, uh, there has been a paradigm shift where um, people who work recording music 
uh, a lot of the time now come from a background of having played music, having been in bands and having been fans of music and ha being steeped in the exposure to live performed music. And so the aesthetic has changed and gradually supplanted the old aesthetic of making studio recordings that were uniquely studio sounding and not necessarily representative of a live sound to um, studio recordings that were intended to evoke a naturalistic or live sound. And the way I've always heard music has been informed by my experience as a music fan and my experience as, as a performer in a band. Uh, so I'm sympathetic to that position, that is, that perspective, which is that the recorded sound should start from a perspective of naturalism or realism. So uh, I have often incorporated the natural room sound of, of, the perf of a drum performance in the, in the final recording. So I'm pretty sure that's what he's talking about. Um, uh, there are some things that crop up in some records that I've worked on. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure which exactly examples he would be talking about, but um, a and often those are made reference other clients of mine make reference to those. Like, for example, I did a number of records with a band called The Jesus Lizard. They had a terrific drummer. They typically had a very lively live sound on the, the drums on their records. And so fans of that band with whom I was working would ask me to do similar things to the drums in their band. So the, the aesthetic progressed from one band to another. And I can't really take credit for being the driving force of that aesthetic. That has to do with the success and the uh, aesthetic of the bands that I was working with uh, resonating with other bands and other working musicians. So uh, I bristle a little at the notion that I have a signature drum sound, but I know what you're talking about, Giannis. Um, and I started making records in a very simplistic project studio. It was in fact an eight track studio that was um, in the basement of the house I was living in. It had a very small performing area, maybe 12 feet by 20 feet, something like that, very low ceiling. And by doing a number of experiments, I was able to develop uh, um, methods for achieving a naturalistic live room sound in a small space. Um, and I have heard other examples of a naturalistic room sound uh, recorded by other people in similar small spaces. So I don't think having a small space at your disposal is necessarily uh, a limitation. Uh, I think if you have a bad sounding room or a room that's quite dead or a room that doesn't have a flattering acoustic, then it's a mistake to try to force the issue and synthesize uh, a room sound. I think you should learn to work with the environment that you're presented with in a way that makes that presentation flattering to the music and the drumming that you're recording at the time. Um, so what I wouldn't do is I wouldn't record the drums dry and then add synthetic reverb to them after the fact to try to simulate a natural room sound. I think I would try to, try to make the recording uh, flattering under the conditions that we were working in. And uh, in, in my experience, when you try to fool Mother Nature, when you try to like synthesize something that isn't genuinely happening, you, you create a, a veneer of artifice that becomes a kind of an impediment to, to hearing the music, for me anyway. Like, as soon as I realize that I'm being lied to in a way, I kind of shut down and stop paying attention as a listener. And I think these elements of phoniness can be an obstacle for some listeners, in, in particular listeners like me who uh, have a sense memory of the experience of seeing music live and l like to have that evoked in, the, in a recording. Uh, and what if I had to work with samples? If, the, if I was presented with a band who had samples as part of their vocabulary, I would do to those samples or with those samples whatever the band wanted me to do. Like if the, if the band typically used samples as a substitute for another band member, um, and they would, then they probably have a perspective on how they should sound. 
And so I would use those samples in the manner that the band normally or ordinarily used them. Esli Sujic asks, what do you think about recording schools? What is the best way for a young engineer to become an assistant to somebody like you? P.S. Some of the records you've engineered are the ones that inspired me as a musician and mixing engineer. Well, that's very nice of you, Esli. I appreciate that. Um, it's, it's flattering to hear because there are records that inspired me and made me want to become a recording engineer. And uh, it would have been nice for me to be able to tell the people who made them uh, that that was the case. And uh, I've never had that opportunity. But anyway. Um, what do you think about recording schools? There, I, I have complicated feelings about recording schools. I think um, taking the initiative to go to a school to learn how to do something uh, betrays a seriousness on the part of the person who's doing it and a commitment which I, I appreciate and I support. Uh, in America at least, there's an extraordinary expense associated with higher education and there are a lot of schools in name only that, are, that have been created to take advantage of uh, people, the willingness of people to spend money on their education. And these are for-profit institutions that, um, that can saddle people with extraordinary debt um, to get out of a four-year program at some of these institutions can cost tens of thousands of dollars. There is money available in the, ter in, in, in the form of student loans so that people can borrow the money to, to pay these institutions to have an education. Um, and I, that industry, the industry of creating debt, is an enormous drag on, on our economy. And so uh, from a philosophical standpoint and from a um, political standpoint, I do not support the notion of these for-profit universities, uh, these for-profit for trade schools, exploiting the availability of student loans to create debt in, uh, in for people who are have the have taken the initiative and um, show the ambition of trying to learn a, a trade. I think that that is an indefensible exploitation and uh, I find it quite hideous, okay? So that's one of my feelings about recording schools. Uh, as regards the students in the recording schools, I'm extraordinarily sympathetic. I, w I want them to be able to have the experience of becoming professionals. I want them to learn what they need to know and to get involved in the recording and music scene, which has been enormously rewarding for me. So I'm sympathetic and I, I, I want, I'm rooting for them. I don't necessarily think a formal academic setting is the best place to learn most of what happens in the studio. You can learn the technical fundamentals and I think that that is a good place to learn the technical fundamentals, although um, most of the technical fundamentals associated with sound recording uh, are derived from other disciplines like physics, acoustics, electronics, a and it may better serve a student to go to an accredited univer full normal university and get a degree in one of those disciplines while appreciating r sound recording or engineering as a sideline or as, a, as an adjunct to that education. Um, there are some comprehensive recording programs at universities, the Tonemeister programs in Europe, for example, and some, uh, some state schools and some universities in North America, um, for example, McGill University in Montreal, University of Iowa, uh, University of Massachusetts at Lowell. Um, a lot of these universities have conventional four-year accredited degrees that can specialize in sound recording or in where you would have, for example, a music degree with a special specialization in sound recording, or you would have a degree in acoustics or a degree in electronics, and you would be allowed to specialize in sound recording. Things of that nature, I, I, I think, may be more worthy of the investment uh, 
in uh, higher education than a specialized trade school recording certificate. Um, but having said that, I have encountered some engineers in the field who went through these trade schools, th these specific specialized recording schools, who have become fine engineers and who do have a comprehensive knowledge of, of their craft and who've made decent careers for themselves. I think the number of people who have done that relative to the number of people who have gone through these programs is, a, is an extraordinarily small number. Um, and I think that the practical experience of making recordings and working with bands and being in a studio environment, that practical experience is dramatically more valuable than the academic experience of having someone tell you something on a chalkboard and you writing it down in your, in your notes and uh, hoping to internalize that through experience later. Um, so I have complex feelings about sound recording schools and um, I think from a political standpoint and from a social standpoint they are, they are part of a dangerous trend of turning education into an industry in the United States uh, and uh, I'm suspicious of that and I am on the whole hostile to that as a, as a construct. But the people in the schools, the people in the programs, the people who are genuinely trying to teach and the people who are genuinely trying to, to learn, uh, I'm completely sympathetic to both of those perspectives. So that's why I say I have complex feelings. And what is the best way for a young engineer to, to become an assistant to somebody like you? Um, there are internship programs at almost all recording studios. We have an internship program, internship program at Electrical Audio. Um, we tend to limit our internships to people who are in academic programs where they are required to perform an, in an internship. And since they are required to perform an internship, if they want to do it with us, uh, we'll try to accommodate everybody. Um, I don't actually, I don't typically have an assistant in a session. Most of the sessions that I run, I'm, uh, I do everything myself. Um, there are other supporting roles inside recording studios. There are technical engineers who do things like equipment maintenance, um, acquisitions, and assisting for visiting guest engineers. And some recording studios uh, have those as full-time positions and some have those just as, as duties that other people in the, in the employee of the studio have to do at, ad hoc as necessary. Um, so I guess what I would say is that if you get into a situation where you can work regularly in a recording studio, some of that work may involve assisting visiting engineers who might be people like me. Um, but if you have an ambition to be, for example, my right-hand man, I, I don't have a right-hand man, and so that ambition would be unutilized, um, like unfulfilled. I apologize. Anik Tapar says, Steve, please talk about The Ghost's first album. I love that record. Such an amazing sound on each instrument, full, warm, and sparkly at the same time. How did you do it? That was the only time I worked with the band The Ghost, I believe and it was a conventional recording session from my perspective where the band set up as they would live, um, everyone playing simultaneously, and I used the range of techniques that I would use in that setting normally. I, I, f I find it hard to spe specify anything because I don't know in particular what your interests are, so I would have to say that I guess the principles that I apply to every recording session applied to that one, that is set the band up so that they're physically comfortable and playing normally and comfortably and have good lines of sight and then let them play their record and try and try not to blow it while I'm putting it on tape. So that's, a, that's I'm sorry that's about the best I can do. Ignatz Nusslis says, uh, what do you feel the future of recordings holds for us? Do you think the sampling era is coming to end, basically, and some sort of classical instruments renaissance is on its way back, even speaking of dance music? Well, uh, 
I'm not qualified to speak on behalf of dance music. I don't typically work on dance music, and uh, I'm not part of the natural audience for dance music, so I can't really speak about that. I'm not familiar with the, the trends and the social uh, organization of, the, of that scene, so uh, I think it's an interesting question with respect to dance music, and I would love to hear somebody who is more ingrained in that culture uh, answer that. As far as the, f the future of recordings uh, is concerned, I've always seen my job as something of an archivist, where the, the bands that come to me to record their music most of the time are not established uh, successful musicians. They're people who, whose music means a lot to them on a personal level. And there is a chance that that music over time will achieve significance with a larger audience, and, and there's a chance that that music will find an audience. And uh, in service of that chance or that opportunity, it's my responsibility to make sure that the recordings that I make will survive long enough for that band to have a shot at finding an audience. And to that end, I use analog methods. That is, I record to analog tape, and I mix down to analog tape, because those analog tape recordings then will survive uh, and are irrespective of whatever changes there are in the computer paradigm or the recording studio paradigm. Uh, you can always take that tape off the shelf and put it on a machine and play it and listen to it or make a record out of it or exploit it commercially or, or at very least get the music off of it. The, the longevity and the stability and the durability of analog tape and tape recordings is unmatched. There is no other thing that you can record to uh, that you can have confidence will, be, will survive beyond the lifetime of the performers. Um, and the, the interchangeability and the universality of those formats uh, are the thing that make it so durable. Uh, if, if you have a, a stereo master tape on a shelf someplace and you take it down 50 years later, you can put it on any stereo machine and play it back. It doesn't have to be the same brand that it was recorded on. It doesn't have to be from the same technological era. Uh, and in fact, it's now possible using modern electronics and modern tape machines to play back masters that were recorded at an earlier era with greater resolution uh, than was possible at the time they were recorded. So it's possible now to recover more information to get a more accurate playback than was possible at the time those historical recordings were made. Um, uh, I see that as an important part of the legacy of the music that's recorded in the sessions that I conduct. Uh, the bands that I'm working with deserve to have their music survive and deserve to have their music be um, kind of uh, obsolescence proof. Um, there will always be tape machines available to play analog masters. There is an extraordinary number of them uh, they're extraordinarily durable machines, and they're relatively simple to fix, maintain, and keep operating. So uh, the, the durability of the format is the rationale that I have for staying in, in the analog uh, domain for every record that I work on. Um, and I, I think that is the future in the sense that all of those master tapes will survive. All of those bands will have the opportunity to exploit those master tapes should their music find an audience. Um, digital sessions are not as durable because the technologies that are embedded in the concept of the digital session are all changing. They're all fungible and they're changing constantly such that in the distant future it may not be possible to mount a computerized session because there may not be available uh, technology that's compatible with that technology that was embedded in the session as it was recorded originally. Um, and 
you know, that's assuming that there is a medium that you can record the session on that will survive and that will be recoverable at that period. We know that analog tape survives and we know that it is recoverable and we know that it is an extraordinarily hardy and durable medium. And for me, that the confidence that that, that, that gives me means that whatever considerations there are about the session, that one fundamental thing isn't going to change. I'm, as long as it's physically possible for me to do it, I am going to be recording on analog tape and I'm going to be mixing stereo masters to analog tape. Andrew Coogan asks, what bands are you listening to right now? What is your favorite band of all time and why is it the Ramones? Uh, well, Andrew, you know that my favorite band of all time is the Ramones, although I actually have a, a kind of a pantheon of maybe a dozen bands that are all, you know, extraordinarily important to me for different reasons. But the Ramones have a special place in my heart because they were the band that got me excited about music. I didn't particularly care about music um, on anything more than a superfi superficial level until I found the Ramones and their music as a vehicle to understand their aesthetic and their perspective as people uh, resonated with me and made me want to take seriously the, the, the kindred notions that I and my friends uh, were bandying about. It, um, the Ramones gave me license to take seriously my own creative ideas and my own cultural perspective. So that's why the Ramones are the most important band for me. As for the bands I'm listening to right now, uh, there are a couple of contemporary bands that I'm really fond of. Are, there's a band from Chicago. Uh, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank right now. Sorry. There's a band from Chicago called Dead Rider, who've also put records out under the name D Rider. And uh, they're a, a terrific band. Um, they're m musicians who have been in other bands. Uh, but there, it seems like the synthesis of their creative energies in this band is, is really reached a peak for all of them. They're, it's really stimulating music, very original and disorienting, uh, sometimes scary, sometimes in, engrossing. I just, I think they, they're very creative approach to their recordings, um, very creative approach to the arrangement and organization of the music in the live setting. Uh, I just, I, I, I just really love that band. Um, there's another band that I found recently that I really like. It's a, a band called Motherfucker. They're uh, just a straightforward rock band, um, but they're, I find them really stimulating. They're just a very energetic band. Um, I like their attitude. I like their presentation. Um, and I've been listening to them kind of a lot lately. Mike Manthe says, please describe a few in-session discoveries that immediately influenced and impacted your future recordings. Why do you think much of the community is disproportionately focused on their tools rather than their ability to make a record with them? Well, the second question is, uh, you can talk about your tools because you're talking about a, uh, a tangible thing or something that everyone else can have uh, a common experience with. Like, uh, if everyone picks up uh, a certain microphone, they'll have some interaction with that microphone, but you know that the microphone is the same in everybody's hands. Uh, or uh, uh, if you have a, a piece of studio outboard equipment, for example, uh, and every, everybody that interacts with that piece of equipment is going to have the same, uh, same knobs and the same display and the same input and output and everything. So there's a, a base of reference there. Like you can talk about it because everyone's had a common experience with that thing. Um, the practice of making records is going to be distinct and unique for everybody that does it. So my interaction with the band in the studio is going to have been developed over the arc of my professional exposure to them uh, and to other bands. So my conversations are informed by previous conversations that I've had and my practical studio techniques are informed by experiences that I've had in the studio during uh, other sessions. So 
my personal knowledge base and my personal experiences are unique to me. And it's very difficult for me to articulate those experiences and those activities to other people in a way that they'll understand them unless they have also been through those th same experiences, unless they have also had those same situations presented to them. But we can talk about a piece of equipment, and every, if I say SM57, everybody knows what I'm talking about. It's a micro ubiquitous microphone. Everyone has had some experience with this microphone. So I think that's why in the recording community people talk about tools and things rather than concepts and techniques and experiences, because until you've actually uh, ex had an experience, you, you can't really have an intelligent conversation about it. And those experiences are unique to everybody that, that, that has them. So I think th that's a, a practical reason for it. I don't think it's because the recording community is, is stupid or is, is being willfully ignorant of the, import the relative importance of it. Of course it's more important how you conduct a session than it is which particular microphone you put on a thing. Of course it's more important. But how you conduct the session is an enormous topic. And which microphone you're using in an instance, well, that's, a, that's an easy thing to grasp. It's an easy thing to throw out. That's one of the reasons why I, I'm quick to share whatever experience I have I, and whatever um, techniques I use. I feel like the, the more open people are about their experiences and their techniques, the, the more likely it is that uh, it, within the recording community we can start to have these common experiences and we can start to broaden the conversational base um, away from just like, you know, what, what limiter was that, you know, that sort of thing. So a few in-session discoveries that immediately influenced and impacted your future recordings. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, uh, I was in a band with a drummer named Ray Washam, and we were recording uh, a demo for that band uh, at the small project studio in my house. And the I was putting up microphone a microphone on the on the rack tom, and Ray had spent a long time tuning the tom to his taste, and the relationship between the top head and the bottom head. It's a pretty important part of what the drum sounds like once it's been tuned. Um, so I was putting a microphone on the, on the top head of the drum and he asked me uh, why I didn't mic up the whole drum. That is why I didn't put a microphone on the bottom head as well, since he'd spent half of his energy tuning that bottom head. Why, you know, why didn't I put a mic there? And I didn't have an answer for him. I was like, I don't know why I don't mic up the whole drum. You know, that makes sense, actually. So I started, from that point on, I started putting mics on the top and bottom uh, of tom-toms. And I noticed, as soon as I did, from the very first experiment, that it provided a more natural, more realistic uh, presentation of the toms. So that's been a standard method for me ever since, is uh, I, I now typically always put a top and bottom, bottom mic on the toms, and that came from that th being asked that question, you know, why don't I mic up the whole drum? Uh, and that has, you know, that's been a, 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 an instant, a moment, that has had dividends for, you know, 25 years now. Uh, I'm trying to think of another something equivalent. Um, Yeah, uh, that, that's enough. That's a pretty good example. So, Okay, Adrian Krebs says, My college professor at Ohio University showed us a technique you developed for miking kit, drum kit, I'm assuming, dubbed the crotch mic. How did you develop this technique? Uh, I'm not certain what, sh what the crotch mic technique is. Um, on more than one occasion, I've recorded a, a band where someone in the band has suggested something, um, a, a microphone in a particular position, for example, and that might be related to, an exp to something that they'd done previously where they'd done it in, in a previous session and it had worked out and they wanted to try it again. I, I typically will always indulge those kind of suggestions, like if someone says, oh, 
I, I'd like you to put a microphone over here. I did it once and it worked, and I'd like to try it again. I'm happy to do that. Um, I'm guessing that this crotch mic technique involves uh, a microphone on a drum kit in the vicinity of the drummer's crotch, uh, and that that microphone in that position came from a suggestion that someone had made. It might have been a random one-off experiment on my part, but I think it's more likely that somebody said, yeah, I recorded my drums once with a, a mic right by my pecker and it sounded great, can we, can we do that? I think that's more likely than that it was my idea. Um, so I'm sorry I can't tell you anything more specific than that other than that it's often fruitful to listen to somebody's suggestion if they have a suggestion about how you should do something. If you have your own methods, you might want to pursue your own methods as well, but if somebody has a suggestion about something, like say a microphone in the crotch, uh, you lose nothing by giving it a shot. You lose nothing by trying it to see if it helps out in the scenario. All right, uh, Mauricio Mendez says, Hi Steve, I love the records you've done. Thank you very much, Mauricio. When you're mixing, are you thinking about how the mastering process will affect the final product? N short answer is no. Uh, I don't expect the mastering engineer to do anything. Um, mastering engineers, of course, will do something, but uh, in my experience, better mastering engineers do very little to master tapes that are already satisfying. If you mix your record and you're unhappy with it, and you expect the mastering engineer to do something radical to it to, to, to help save it, then uh, I think that's a, a kind of a last ditch effort. That's kind of a desperate measure. Um, I typically work on something in the studio until everyone is happy with it, and then we send it off as a finished product. And the mastering engineer, in the sense of um, manipulating that sound isn't expected to do very much at all. Now, there's a complication that comes from the process of assembling an album from individual songs. When you're mixing, you're typically working on one song, and you work on that song until you're satisfied with it, and then you record it to the master reel, and then it sits there, and then you, you do another song and until you're happy with that, and then that gets recorded, and eventually you, you build up uh, this library of songs from which you're going to assemble an album. And then when th that album is sequenced together, you've been listening to each of the songs individually, but now you're hearing them as an album, you hear them in context, one with the other, and it's quite likely that there will be some irregularities exposed by that, the, the listening to the album as a whole. Like when you hear this song finish and the next song start, the next song may come in slightly weak because it was mixed at a slightly lower level, or maybe it doesn't have quite as much high frequency energy or not as much power in the low end, something like that. Those slight differences are the sort of things that can be uh, normalized somewhat in mastering, but those should always be, those mastering changes should always be at the behest and under the instruction of the band and not just a bright idea that the mastering engineer has. So, uh, for example, if I'm mixing a song, uh, I'm trying to make it sound satisfying as is. I'm not thinking, oh, that I'm going to make it sound okay and the mastering engineer will make it sound for real good. Uh, I think that that's a dangerous perspective to have. I think you should, when you're mixing, you should try to make things sound exactly precisely as you would like them to be. And then the mastering en engineer's job should be to make whatever small adjustments you think are necessary on reflection and after having lived with the, the finished mix for a long period of time. So I don't think mixing with the expectation that mastering will change your mix, I think I don't think that that's a productive mindset. I think that's actually a dangerous mindset and it encourages more aggressive mastering behavior. And in my experience, the better mastering jobs and the bettering, better mastering engineers are very judicious and very and minimal to the point of, uh, of having a degree of reverence for the, the effort that was put into making the album in the first place. You know, you, 
you don't want the mastering engineer to be uh, sort of uh, changing or negating all of the, the concentrated effort that goes into making a record in the studio at the last moment right before it gets sent out to the listening public. I think the mastering engineer should do as little as possible and whatever he does in terms of changing the sound quality should be under the direction of the band whose record is, whose name is on the cover. So. Last question is from Jesse Miller and he says, as an avid user of two inch tape on my MCI JH24, I often wonder if I'm approaching my tracking technique to tape a bit too conservatively uh, and leaving myself more work come mix time. Question how much EQ and compression will you do on the way in when combining multiple mics on sources, say kicks and snares, for example? Are you treating each individually and then treating the source track as well on a subgroup prior to hitting tape? I tend to record to tape what I think is should be uh, a satisfying final sound uh, on the record. That is, um, if I'm happy with the way things are sounding in the basic recording, then I don't assume that I will need to change that much at the mixing stage. So I tend to try to make things sound the way I think they should sound or in, in a, uh, try to make them sound satisfying at least going into the multi-track and then presumably that will make my job at mixing easier. Um, the question of how much EQ and compression I use is kind of hard to quantify. I tend to use less EQ and less compression than a lot of other engineers that I see, uh, but I'm, I'm not religious about it. I'm happy to use an equalizer or a compressor if necessary. I just find that they, I think they are necessary less often than other people do. If I hear, if I'm listening to, for example, the bass drum or the snare drum, and the sound isn't satisfying, rather than reaching for an equalizer or doing something to the dynamics of the sound, I'm much more likely to physically move the microphone, try a different microphone, something like that. Um, it all starts with listening to the drum kit, like I'll listen to the drummer play, and that gives me a frame of reference for what the natural sound of the, of the drum kit is and I go into the control room having set up mics that I think will capture that and then if I, if I find that unsatisfying when I'm listening then I'll change something. I'll change the microphone, I'll change the position of the microphone. Um, sometimes the microphones reveal uh, an aspect of the, the drum kit or of the whatever you're recording that isn't apparent if you listen casually but becomes apparent when you listen uh, in detail through the microphone and that may not be a flattering thing. Uh, I still consider that an engineering problem because if you can listen to something in real life and it sounds nice and satisfying and you listen to the recording of it and it doesn't sound satisfying, well the fault is in the, the recording. The fault isn't in the source material, in the source sound because you just heard it in real life and it sounded good. Um, so th the whole of the engineering job is to take satisfying sounds that are occurring in the real world and move them down a wire somehow and record them on tape. So uh, there are anomalies introduced by the recording process and sometimes you, sometimes you can ameliorate those or sometimes you can use those anomalies to good effect because they uh, evoke the experience of listening to the thing live. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, when you're listening to someone play the drums live, there's a physical sensation from the drums, which is a, you could call that a low frequency content, but um, I'm actually talking about, you know, the, the vibration in the room and the air pressure from coming off of the drums and the, the, the synthesis of that plus the visual impression that the drummer is making while you're watching him, um, that evokes an experience, that, that, that um, conflates to an experience. 
uh, and that the totality of that experience is what you're trying to evoke in the control room. Um, if you stick a microphone in the room and capture the sound, you may not successfully evoke that experience. Um, so often you'll have to do things like augment uh, an area microphone with a spot microphone so that you get the proper emphasis in, in balance and uh, in the recording that you have when, the, 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 when you're in front of the drum kit, the impression that it makes on you is that certain sounds are bigger or more powerful than others. And if you just do an acoustic recording of that sound, you may not capture that impression. So you may need to aug augment that area recording with close mics on the bass drum or close mics on the snare drum. Or you may need to use a microphone that has a particularly strong bass response so that you can uh, have more bass energy in the recording and that can help to synthesize the experience of listening to the drums. Um, so I'm not opposed to, use, to doing manipulations to the source sounds on the way into the multi-track at all. A and I, if necessary, I will. But the ultimate goal is to make it so the recording is satisfying by itself and doesn't depend on later work or later magic to become satisfying. Like I, like, I like to be able to record something and hit playback and listen to it and fe feel like that's, if the record came out like that, I would be content. You know, that, that's the most satisfying kind of recording is where I, I don't have anything on my mind about, um, I don't have any reservations in my, on my mind about, you know, what I wish it would have sounded like. Um, I, I try to do the engineering job to the point where the, the recordings do sound the way I wished they would sound. So thank you very much. Those were interesting questions and stimulated me while I was reading them. Uh, if you have additional questions, you can always get a hold of me through uh, my email address or through the Electrical Audio Forums, and I'm happy to answer additional questions. So thank you very much for your attention, and uh, enjoy recording things. <laughs>